Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to some of you and peace out to the rest of you. You know who it is and what to do. I won't go into all of that like I normally do. But if I may, I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you what may be one of the most important, if not the most important, it's one of the most important messages I may ever record to you. That message is um, that we must make sure we deserve the freedom that we want. We don't necessarily need to uh, be perfect and we're not going to. But we like to spiritualize our struggle, which is a good thing. Morally speaking, as long as you understand you were dealing with those who have no morals. As long as that is understood, you can spiritually and uh, you can spiritualize and moralize your struggle. But you got to know what you're getting into. And one reason why I don't tell us to get into Mott that heavy is because. Uh, it sounds good, but by the same token, those who have claimed Mott have done some things that, uh, I mean, in ancient Kemet, they've done some things they would have never tolerated being done to them, and they bragged about it. But we also have to get rid of this idea that uh, we are a culture or a race of people that don't fight back and haven't fought back before. We have fought back, and we have fought back in the name of Jesus. We fought back in the name of the ancestors, and we have fought back in the name of Orishas, and we have fought back in the name of Allah. In either case, I'm going to say, while I recommend that we only do anything in the name of Allah, because I'm a Muslim, I must also tell us that we must um, make sure that we don't make new enemies, rightfully so. And this is why you need to know about other people. You will then find out who would hold you back, who has held you back, and who has not. And what has been done to them in the meantime. One example is the Zanzibar Revolt of 1964. We think that the Arab has always trampled on us, and I'm here to tell you that's not true either. The Zanzibar Revolt of 1964 is the case in which a Ugandan named Okello, a Christian uh, who was a menial laborer, claimed to hear the voice of God telling his people to overthrow the Arab hegemony and hierarchy that had been in place since maybe 1698. And the black population of Zanzibar was largely Muslim. They saw uh, why he would say kill the Arabs and throw them over, but they did not understand what, this, what the problem was with Islam. And after leading the revolution, he wound up going back destitute, deported to Uganda. He spoke... Swahili, but he spoke with a strong regional accent that was not normal for Zanzibar. The black majority, belonging to different parties, but one of them being the Afro Shirazi Party, meaning that that was his name, um, rightfully began to overthrow the Arabs because it was sick of the Arab racism. They said, if we're the majority, then we're not going to tolerate a parliament that is mostly Arab. And one of the parliamentarians in Arab um, said, if we rule you, it is not because we're racist. It is because our mental capacity is so high and yours is so low. Pretty much saying, we're just smarter than you. And of course, black people began to be more offended. And at some point, they started to kill the men as violently as they could, gang rape the women, but also the children. They began to commit atrocities that 
we black folks don't normally think that we would commit. See, we tend to be outraged by the things that we ourselves do because our sense of morality is very high. And I think most human beings have that, uh, just to be fair. But human beings, every race, tend to also outrage themselves when they're angry. Were black people right to throw them over? Yes. Were black people right to uh, cut them while still alive brutally and then gang rape the women and the children? Absolutely not. Now, for Muslims, I would not have been against taking these women as concubines. Go ahead. But to gang rape them? That's uncivilized. Gang rape the, the kids? Come on now. Now, the ironic thing was that these Arabs were Omani Arabs. And the Omanis in Oman are not racist and discriminatory. They're generally a nice people. They're known as being the nicest of the Arabs for the most part. But uh, the ones that lived in Zanzibar with us clearly were racist. They were just used to being on the top and I'm not going to sit up and say that there weren't bad habits on the part of black folks um, that would have made us easier to rule. What I am saying is that Arabs in general ain't no better. There's nothing about them that would enable them to rule except that they will band together when they're around us. It's been like that. Without even hating black people, they will cooperate with each other when they don't like each other, when we're the majority, and then when they're the minority, and that's usually in the case where uh, when they're the minority surrounded by us, they'll cooperate with each other, coalesce. But when they are the minority surrounded by you-know-who, they won't. And the funny thing is that even Okello <laughs> um, said, don't kill whites, and they didn't. They left the whites alone. The irony of it, right? He led the revolution, but he never became much after that because he alienated the same population that carried out the revolution with his um, messianic claims of being able to hear voices in revelation. But the things that Christian or Muslim black folks in Zanzibar did, not having a revolution, but the things they did in this revolution, the atrocities, were no different from what Europeans have done. It was lesser, and it didn't really take long, so the duration of it was not much. The severity of it was pretty bad. We are not wrong when we fight people that have done it. They even so much as just rule us with an attitude. We're not wrong. That black man that slapped that Chinese man for calling us monkeys on TV and on a, in front of a camera in Kenya was completely right for what he did. Smacked him and embarrassed him. The revolution in Zanzibar was necessary. Them Arabs had it coming. Because even the Omanis that live in Oman would not have approved of something like this. But see, Zanzibar was not a part of Oman at this time. There was a time it had been. This kind of thing did not necessarily, the, th the things that they had done um, did not necessarily happen. But see, not only did Arabs, but South Asians also got caught up in this. Black folk pretty much pushed everybody out that wasn't black. However, white folks, though they were running because they didn't know that uh, the orders were given not to kill any whites, the thing is that white folks were too small a number and they were too scared anyway to be the threat. I want y'all to keep this in mind too. We aren't wrong for our resistance. But when we fight back, we need to make sure that we're not being immoral. And it's not because the rest of the world is fair to us but it's simply because 
we like to be fair and we like to act like life is going to be fair. No, we need to be brutal against those who are brutal, but it needs to be measured. And it doesn't need to be something you just do across the board to everybody based on origin. We also need to be a people who don't only turn to God on a personal level after atrocities and in times of need and fear. We love to get close to God. Now, many of us love to get close to God in some way, form or fashion uh, across the board. Many of us do. Or we love to think about him. The problem is that many of us don't actually try to get obedient to God until there's a calamity. In our lives personally. In other words, too many of us, even while being spiritual and religious across the board, we don't actually become God fearing until we're very ill, we're very poor, facing eviction, things like this. Actually turning to God instead of just talking to him is something many of us will only do in a position of affliction. If it takes affliction for you to actually remember God and your moral decisions, you're not ready. To actually remember God and our moral decisions should be something that is routine for us when we're going through an easy time, when we're blessed. See, you can get close to God through gratitude for what's going good, or you can get close to God for fear and stress because of what evil befalls you. Which one are you going to be? Most of us have chosen uh, the second one. We need to be a people that will draw near to God on a personal level, actually fearing him in our moral decisions when things are going well. Because if you want to know why it just seems like, you know, some of the best people have the worst things happen to them, it's not the only reason because there is the fact that God will test people that claim to draw near to him, even if they don't. You could say you worship Jesus and he'll turn around and test you. But there's also the fact that many of us wait until things get bad to actually obey this Lord. And so consequently, bad things keep happening and bad things keep happening and bad things keep happening because God's giving them an out. But unfortunately, the person has chosen to only fear the Lord when things are bad. And that's not the time to actually fear him when you're making moral decisions. If having some money in your hands means you're going to indulge in vices more so, then yes, if God loves you, expect him to impoverish you. But also in fighting back, it is okay to be... Um, militant and aggressive against enemies but there are limits that we need in fearing God there need to be limits we would not cross even if you take women as concubines because that's what happens in wars that's a concubine that's you don't turn around and just commit rapes and especially of, of especially gang rapes and rapes of children that's not it and let's be honest, we've had rebellions and resistances for which we don't give each other credit, this being one of them, although I wouldn't say that the way to fight is the way, the way they fought is the way to fight. I wouldn't say that, of course, because I just described to you the atrocities that would even outrage many of you listening. But if you take other resistances, like the Mali Revolt of 1835 in uh, Salvador de Bahia, Brazil, a Muslim began a Muslim initiated revolt, jihad against the enslaved owners, the, uh, the enslavers and slaveholders. The 1522 revolt uh, shout out to Don Calypso for sending me that link started by Muslims. The revolt of Ahmed Yusuf Gabrun in which he went into Zanzibar in the 1800s and killed Omani enslavers and freed Bantu slaves 
These are times, and there have been countless revolts and revolutions and jihads in Western Africa, as evidenced by Muhammad Sharif, more than I, those I don't know, and some, I've, uh, some about whom I've forgotten. This has happened before. And so we need to understand that at no point has the religion of Islam been something that disempowers us. Not when actually practiced. Anyway, I think I've gotten the point across. Thank you for listening. Black heart, black mind, black out, and black heterosexual non-select male power just because they don't like it and a black moralistic patriarchy until extinction or judgment day. Assalamu alaikum.